is the being that we meet. In the last half of the 19th century, organised vegetarianism throws itself into questions of global politics, slavery, colonialism and votes for women. This episode, we'll discover the abolitionist vegetarian settlement in the Wild West, how the British Empire accidentally got more Hindus to go vegetarian, and I'm getting on my bike to discover just how surprisingly big vegetarianism was in London in the 1880s. Vegetarianism, the story so far with me, Ian MacDonald. Episode 13, Vegetarians. It's 1850. American vegetarians swiftly follow the British in setting up a vegetarian society. I'm Adam Sprenson. I'm a system professor of history at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania. The story of the American Vegetarian Society when it establishes itself first in 1850 is a pretty remarkable trajectory towards success. If you went to a convention, you'd meet hundreds of vegetarians. And the mix is fairly similar across the Atlantic. There are leading figures from the vegetarian congregation of Bible Christians, There are respected medical men, including an ex-president of the American Medical Association, Reuben Mussey. And there are enthusiasts for fringe medical theories, particularly the so-called water cure. It's gone together with vegetarianism ever since Dr. Lamb, back in the early 19th century, prescribed distilled water in the vegan diet. Both internal and external bathing as a means of procuring health. Internal bathing sounds like a euphemism. Colonic irrigation? (laughs) Yes, that is exactly what they were talking about. Good to know. I can't cover everyone, but let me pick out two particularly fascinating people. The Englishman who leads American vegetarianism and takes a bullet for the USA, and the American feminist and water curist who sets up London's first known vegetarian restaurant. Mary Gove Nichols is a really interesting figure, because I think that she is probably the most active woman involved in organized vegetarianism at the time. So organized vegetarianism takes a very women's right focused ideology. But in practice, women were kind of relegated to secondary roles, at least at meetings and things like that. But Mary Gove is a prolific speaker and writer. When, in 1842, an English recruit abandoned the New England vegan commune we featured last show, it was for a life of activism with Mary. After he dies, she forms an open marriage with Dr Nichols, a fellow water curist. She talks about vegetarian cookery as a means of liberating women from the kitchen so that it takes less time to prepare. That means that women had more of an opportunity to serve more important functions, political functions, reform functions. The lives of women as wives and as cooks are worn out in providing for artificial wants which bring disease upon families. Mary Gove Nichols also viewed meat preparation as a way of degrading women. Purity is the great law of life. She's complex and hard to categorise. In 1857, this so-called abess of free love embraces Roman Catholicism, as does her husband. We shall meet her again in England. Henry S. Club is a really fascinating figure. His early life is a tour of English vegetarianism. Raised originally in the Swedenborgian church, was drawn towards the Bible Christian movement in England. Lives at the Concordium, the vegan commune in London. Emigrates to the United States in 1853 and becomes immediately involved in the reformist politics of the time. He serves as a reporter for the New York Tribune, which is the newspaper that's most aligned with sort of radical reforms, particularly the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement. For much of the reform press, vegetarianism is an allied movement. For example, the Liberator, 
newspaper of the fight to abolish slavery promotes the annual meeting of the American Vegetarian Society. To vegetarians and friends of human progress everywhere, of both sexes, the invitation is quarterly extended. The abolitionist press and the reform press at large present vegetarians as heroes, as dedicated intellectuals. But the popular press, on the other hand... Presented vegetarians as generally weak, emaciated, kind of sickly looking. So if there's ever any line drawings of vegetarians, they look just physically weak, sallow. Um, Often they're presented as vegetables themselves. And Club Plans of Venture that combines vegetarianism with the fight against slavery. Club comes up with this idea to start a utopian experiment in Kansas, which at this point is a territory. It's not an organized state. So Kansas has yet to decide whether it's going to allow slavery. People who are pro-slavery forces and anti-slavery forces just flooding into Kansas to try to win this demographic race. To be able to outvote and outfight the other side. Heading out into this largely unsettled territory, the difference with Club's group is that they decided to organize around the principle of vegetarianism, as well as an interesting architectural theory known as octagon design. That's the theory of a leading vegetarian called Orson Fowler that octagonal buildings have more space and light. The Chicago Tribune rails against them that... Kansas has got enough philosophers, fiddlers, phrenologists, vegetarians, etc. already. She needs beef-eating men. Men with thews and sinews who have blood to spare and the pluck to put themselves in places where the loss of it might happen. Henry Club forms a company and sells stock to raise funds. He promises, ultimately, a liberal town with a library, a university. Niceties meant at personal uplift... Fifty families sign up, gathered from the American Vegetarian Society and other excited reformers. So there is a bit of a buzz about this. Henry Club reports from the initial group of pioneers in Kansas. A gristmill is already on the ground, and saws are on the way. At present, the residents are enduring some of the inconveniences common to the commencement of all settlements. But they will soon be all comfortably housed. In theory, this is better funded and organised than the previous vegetarian communities. But when the main group of settlers arrives, there's just one building. Most people are still living in tents. Henry Club himself is in an abandoned wigwam. A lot of the settlers head back east upon seeing what wasn't there upon arrival. Perhaps neither directors nor settlers were ready for the Wild West. The summer's harsh. As the fall runs into winter, it gets pretty desperate. Thankfully, we're not talking about starvation levels. So all but the hardcore abandon it. But what's important is that the story doesn't end there. Many of the individuals who showed up with this incredible zeal remain in the territory because they know that the political question is still at stake. But what's interesting is many of them end up becoming violently involved in the battles between free staters and slave staters in Kansas. This is the prelude to the American Civil War. Just actually people who are violently abolitionists, that you just have to kill as many slaveholders as possible. But Henry Club never picks up a gun. Not when offered a revolver to defend the settlement against slavers. Not even when the Civil War starts and he enlists as a quartermaster. But there's an incredible irony here. Henry Club, despite the fact that he's personally involved in arming soldiers, chooses to not carry a firearm. It's a remarkable expression of these tensions that are facing vegetarianism during this time period. He also witnesses the death and desperation on the battlefield. I saw a great many wounded and dead men, and saw scenes which I never wish to see again. It seems hard that our men, who are innocent, have to suffer so much. But such is war, and we must have patience until it is over. A few days after writing that, unarmed and in the thick of the fighting, Henry Club is shot. And the only thing that saves him is that he happens to have his naturalization papers sitting inside his lapel pocket. And the papers are shredded and destroyed, but it actually stops the bullet from entering into his body and saves his life. 
I know it's since become a cliche, but it's Henry Club's story and we're sticking to it. And not everyone is so lucky. His fellow vegetarian settler, Samuel Stewart, is killed in combat. And by the time this cruel war is over, the American Vegetarian Society itself has closed down. Is it fair to say that organised American vegetarianism sacrifices itself to stop slavery? I think that's absolutely fair to say that the principle of pacifism had been a tradition dating back to the earliest vegetarian settlers coming from the Bible Christian Church. But the slavery cause becomes so important that vegetarianism itself as kind of a singular practice to perfect all reform becomes less important in the shadow of the issue of abolitionism. Henry Klump himself, writing later, admits... But the political excitement owing to the attempt to introduce slavery into free territory and the effort to prevent this by immigration to Kansas absorbed public attention and all moral reforms had to be suspended until freedom was ultimately established. In 1857, British popular attention is focused on India, where a revolt has been reported is backed by a new paper cartridge and its animal fat. You see, the Indian troops are being switched from muskets to rifles. The cartridge with the gunpowder and bullet in it is made out of paper, and it needs to be greased to be stuffed into the rifle. One British vegetarian magazine puts it, Whilst an abundance of vegetable oil might have been used, this operation has been affected with lard, specifically of pigs abhorrent to Muslims and cows sacred to Hindus. And thus the native sepoys consider themselves contaminated in having to tough and bite the cartridge in the routine of their duty. The East India Company insists that those cartridges only went to European troops and the underlying causes of the revolt aren't part of our story. But war spreads along the Ganges plain. Afterwards, the last vestiges of the Mughal Empire, the last vestiges of veg-curious Emperor Akbar, if you remember him, are swept away, along with the East India Company, along with the independence of princely states, all into the British Raj. And I discovered, to my surprise, that this wasn't all bad for Indian vegetarianism. It's obviously bad for morale. In the 1880s, the schoolboys of strongly vegetarian Gujarat share a forbidden doggerel. Behold the mighty Englishman, he rules the Indian small. Because being a meat eater, he is five cubits tall. But I found out in India that the Raj, by trying to apply inflexible definitions to a continent of a hundred thousand gods, actually encourages vegetarianism. Consider the word Hinduism. I've been using it to describe, for want of a better phrase, Indian paganism since the Middle Ages. But when I did that in an interview with venerable historian D. N. Jha, he corrected me. Hindus never described themselves as Hindus. Hindu becomes identity only in 19th century. You might remember Professor Jha from the start of our series. We talked in his book-lined office, in his apartment, looking out onto the clotheslines of a busy Delhi suburb. The word Hindu goes from being the word Muslims use for non-Muslims to the British catch-all term for people who aren't something else. But if you consider some of the followers of Sufi and Bhakti saints we met a few episodes ago and how they straddle the Muslim-Hindu boundary, you realise it's hard enough for British census officers to decide who to call a, quote, Mohammedan, and who a Hindu? When the British came here, then they started their process of census. And it is at that time that they were categorized as Hindus. And the distinction between Hindus and Muslims sometimes was so fuzzy that in some census records also, you have Hindu Muhammadans, <laughs> which means that they are both Hindus and then Muhammadans. So what happened was that in 1911 census, census commissioner, his name was Edward Gate, and he issued a circular. What is this nonsense 
of Hindu Mohammedans or Mohammedan Hindus. Put them in either of the two categories. Don't put them like this. They can't be both. So the British tell most Indians that they are Hindus and many unite around the word. This tract, name-checking many of the sects and philosophies of India, is from Tamil South India. You might recognize Veg friendly Vaishnavism from the medieval India episode. Hereafter, Hindus should not fight among themselves, calling themselves Tenkalais, Vadakalais, Shaivites, Vaishnavites, Advaitins, Vishishtadvaitins and Dvaitins. They should act as one man and oppose the Christian religion. But what does Hinduism mean? For some people, in some places, being vegetarian is important, particularly if you want to be high caste. Burton Cletus is Professor Jia's colleague at Jawaharlal Nehru University, and I came to his office on campus. You, if you look at the census records from 1875 onwards, you have a large number of instances where lower caste communities gather together at, at places and say that we will not consume meat from now onwards. So the British, in doing a massive census that asked people what their caste status was, yes. actually codified things which were a bit fluid before. Yes, exactly. In the process, making people who are seen as lower caste go, OK, we're going to have to move ourselves up the social gear. And one of the ways you did that was by going, OK, we are now vegetarian. We are now pure. Yes. If you look at the census record, they, they always claim that our social position, our low social position is because we were basically like Brahmins at some point and we consumed this meat or we consumed that meat. Of we course, caste practices are much broader than diet. And, uh, at times they change their names, at times they change their practices, their professions, their behaviours in order to raise themselves in social hierarchy. So this whole move towards vegetarianism became a major issue. There's obviously a big difference between vegetarianism being an ethic and it being the basis of caste prejudice, a topic we'll return to in the last episode. But this expectation of vegetarianism even affects traditional Indian medicine, such as Ayurveda. Ayurveda has undergone fundamental transformation in the modern period. It tends to identify itself with a larger vegetarian tradition. Bhaskar Chakraborty is a professor of modern Indian history at the University of Calcutta. In his office, he told me how vegetarianism is at the heart of the new debates about Hindu identity. It is connected with the attempt to find out a correct Hindu way of life. It is connected with Hindu revivalist ideas. It is connected with Arja Samaj activity. So what does Arya Samaj actually mean? Arja Samaj is a particular group which were anxious to restore the pristine purity of Hindu religion. It means propagation of Aryanism. Arya or Arja or Arya means noble, as well as, in theory, the ancestors who composed India's oldest sacred verses, the Vedas. You've probably heard the word abused by Western racists, but that's nothing to do with our story. Arya Samaj is egalitarian, casteless, iconoclastic and monotheistic, like the organised Western religions to which the reformers compare Hinduism. Arya Samaj points to an infallible sacred text, the Vedas, and it will remain a force for vegetarianism in India into the 21st century. Later on, the Arya Samajis and some Hindu Orthodox sections they came together and started a campaign all over this country. In many areas, such as where we are in Bengal, even Brahmins eat meat. So instead, they unite around the beloved and economically vital cow. So cow killing and eating beef became identified with the Muslims. They denied the fact that in the past, the Brahmins also ate beef. And once it became identified with the Muslims, the entire cow production issue became a site of contest between Hindus and Muslims. Sometimes this descends into communal violence. If there was a certain logic of vegetarianism behind it, that particular logic became entirely irrelevant in the way the cow production issue unfolded by the close of the 19th century. And so the quest for Hindu identity settles not on vegetarianism, 
but cow protection. China and Japan aren't colonised like India, but they face similar issues. You might remember the expert in Chinese vegetarianism whom I visited in Paris, Vincent Goussard. And in some cases, there was even a complete rejection of Chinese culinary culture, even rejecting chopsticks and that kind of things. Both China's vegetarian fasting tradition and Japan's medieval aversion to farming animals come under pressure. The idea that uh, the Chinese should become stronger and therefore should eat more meat. Exactly the same conversation that's happening in yes. India at the same time. Of course, of course. And, and, and in Japan as well. And then the Japanese used to eat extremely little red meat. They, they would eat lots of fish, of course, a uh, little bit of poultry. But the, the very idea of eating red meat was almost unknown in Japan. And, and one of the first things the Meiji Emperor did to really show people that things were changing. January 1872. That he publicly let it known that he had beef and that it was a shock to people. It was really a, an epochal change uh, for, the, for Japanese society and the Japanese took up eating meat uh, pretty quickly. Japan's vegetarian traditions are almost entirely lost. But in China, new vegetarian folk religions spring up and Christian missionaries find Chinese vegetarianism so stubborn that they refer to the sect of vegetarians. Missionaries see breaking the vegetarian fast, which in China and India forbids eggs, as a test of sincere conversion. For example, one missionary boasts of a Chinese convert. Her idols, beads and other idolatrous possessions she brought to the missionaries, and by eating an egg, broke her religious abstinence of 17 years, cutting all connections with her old manner of life. But if the new British Empire accidentally helps Indian vegetarianism, it's a setback for vegetarianism at home. Professor Julia Twick of the University of Kent was the first modern academic to look at British vegetarian history. So we saw it um, in the early 19th century connected with all these utopian groups and ideas. But in the middle of the century, what we think of high Victorianism, the era of the 1850s and 60s, then we can see quite a considerable decline. So what's high Victorianism? High Victorianism is, I suppose, the period of Victorian confidence. With British war victories in India and the Crimea, radical causes are in retreat. When the Vegetarian Society's founding fathers pass away in the 1850s, they're not really replaced until the tide turns. Um, it's not the world that we get in the 1880s when we begin to see some new concerns, new social movements questioning that Victorian world. And I'm thinking of movements in politics, in feminism, nature cure, diet reform, pacifism, Indian spirituality, across a whole range of things. And it becomes a little bit more common as a diet. We see the beginnings of emergence in London, particularly, of vegetarian restaurants. Not great numbers of them, but clearly recognisable restaurants. And of course, I live in London, so let's get out of the studio, onto the bike, and go on a tour of some of the faces and places of Victorian vegetarian London. The Alpha, the first food reform restaurant. I'm on London's Oxford Street, um, which is buses and traffic and shoppers now. In the 1870s, where I'm standing would have been the Alpha, set up by Mary Gove Nichols and her husband, uh, just across from the Oxford Theatre, serving for old pennies, soups, porridges and lentil cutlets and pies. Mary fled the USA with her husband at the start of the Civil War. Not that there's any sign they agreed with slavery, they disagreed with fighting a war over it, a fairly common opinion at the time, even if rare amongst vegetarians. And as luck would have it, right next door today, there's Vitao, uh, a vegan cafe. We have soup with lentils, with chickpeas, with mixed vegetables. And just looking at the buffet, lots of beanie, chilli and spinach and chickpea stews. They're often like clubhouses. They sometimes had places where meetings could be held. Notices would be put up in them. So again, something that's a characteristic of vegetarian restaurants still today. 
I'm just in Great Russell Street, five minutes from the Alpha, passing meeting rooms where Anna Kingsford had talks about mysticism and visions. And on my left, the British Museum, where she spent a lot of time researching history. As well as her take on spirituality, Anna Kingsford is a formidable vegetarian anti-vivisection activist. So I assume she nipped between the museum and the Alpha. To help arguments against vivisection, she gets a medical degree. Not deterred by the fact that women are barred from British medical schools, she goes to Paris, graduating in 1880, with a thesis arguing for vegetarianism and becoming the first woman to do so without any experiments on live animals. I do not love men and women. It is not for them that I am taking up medicine and science, not to cure their ailments, but for the animals and for knowledge generally. Again, it's not that everyone with it who's an anti-vivisectionist um, is at this period a vegetarian, um, but many vegetarians are taken up with and concerned about the cruelty of um, vivisection, um, which was in this period relatively uncontrolled. Her attempts to join Buddhism to mystical Christianity connect her to a new movement called Theosophy that will become strongly pro-vegetarian. Theosophy is a very interesting movement that draws on Indian ideas and is inspired by the wisdom of the East in that broad sort of sense, but attempts also to draw into it all sorts of traditions, so mystical Christian ideas are contained within it as well. For Anna Kingsford, the two themes of her life are inseparable. But the disciple of Buddha and of Pythagoras, the preacher of the pure life and of the perfect way, cries to humanity... Under all your pseudo-civilization lies a foul and festering sore. Away, then, with the slaughterhouses. Make to yourselves a nobler ideal of life and of human destiny. It's a movement that, interestingly, crosses between Britain and India. So there's theosophical activity in India developing in this period as well. Theosophy even tries to link up with the aforementioned Hindu Aurya Samaj in 1878, but that doesn't work out. Unfortunately... Dr Kingsford dies young, making herself ill, campaigning in the rain. My next visit is to her moral successor, who will lead Theosophy into being more pro-vegetarian. In the 21st century, this is, this is trendy East London, with lots of people enjoying street food and bargains amongst the, the 18th century Huguenot houses and the, the modern shopping. But it's 1888, and this is the heart of the poverty-stricken East End. If I told you in a few months one of Jack the Ripper's victims will be found just metres from where I'm standing, you'll get a, a sense of the period. But I'm here for an old French Huguenot chapel that's become by now a social centre. There's a blue plaque on the wall saying, amongst other things, that in 1888, Anne Bissant held the Match Girl Strike Meetings here, helping establish British trade unionism. Annie Bizant is currently known as a scandalous promoter of birth control. A court has even ruled her, because of her atheism, an unfit mother. She's also a socialist agitator of oppressed workers like the matchmakers, one of the first women to be elected to a local school board, and a vegetarian <sighs> activist. It's a substantial space with a curved balcony uh, that looks every inch an old chapel, a plain Protestant chapel and this is where Annie Bissant organised some of the first strikes in Britain. In 1889 she'll convert to theosophy and that's what she'll become best known for. I'm just on Farrington Street I can see the glorious red of Hoburn Viaduct but if I was here in 1888 I might have passed a, uh, a lanky Indian student looking for somewhere to eat. I launched out in search of a vegetarian restaurant. This is Mahandas in his own later words, a law student striving to stay vegetarian because of a vow he'd made his mother before a Jain monk back home in Gujarat, India. I would trot 10 or 12 miles each day, go into a cheap restaurant and eat my fill of bread but would never be satisfied. I'm looking at a, a big office building, glass and mock marble and plastic, but this is where the central vegetarian restaurant was, and I, I brought a photo of what it looks like, a complete Victorian building, 
rather like the present day neighbours. Red brick with white plaster work, pretend neoclassical columns, and words on the windows saying vegetarian dining rooms, and one floor up, breakfast, dinners, tea, soups, porridge. The sight of it filled me with the same joy that a child feels on getting a thing after its own heart. And these are important points of contact where people can meet others um, and can find a diet that they, they can eat. Before I entered, I noticed books for sale exhibited under a glass window near the door. I saw among them Saul's plea for vegetarianism. This I purchased for a shilling and went straight to the dining room. This was my first hearty meal since my arrival in England. I can't mention every leading reformer who embraces vegetarianism, but Henry Salt stands out for his wit. The motive that you'll find most strong, the simple rule, the short and long, for doing animals no wrong is this, that you are one. From the date of reading this book, I may claim to have become a vegetarian by choice. I bless the day on which I had taken the vow before my mother. Mohandas is bringing the Indian arguments about meat-eating with him, and Western reformers are helping him make up his mind. I had all along abstained from meat in the interests of truth and of the vow I had taken, but had wished at the same time that every Indian should be a meat-eater, and had looked forward to being one myself freely and openly some day, and to enlisting others in the cause. The choice was now made in favour of vegetarianism, the spread of which henceforward became my mission. So when Mohandas stumbles into the vegetarian scene, How would you describe it? I describe it as small, urban, organised around personal contacts, but also around cafes. Mohandas gets swiftly recruited into vegetarian activism. There are various overlapping groups. For example, Greater Manchester has the original Vegetarian Society. Mohandas is on the executive of the London Vegetarian Society, which is stricter, though that means it's against dangerous stimulants, alcohol and tobacco, rather than being against eggs and milk. He meets Annie Bizant, who encourages him to take an interest in his own Hindu scriptures. Other comrades are industrialists whose impact still echoes today. They're not unlike today. Arguments about other issues can take over. The same kind of issues that divided Concordites last episode. Mohandas notes... The president of the society was Mr Hills, proprietor of the Thames Iron Works. He was a Puritan. Mr Hills is best known to posterity for this, founding and funding his works football team, West Ham. Dr Thomas Allenson, on the other hand, wants to reform food and family planning. And in the East End, my voice is getting worn out. I'm in East London outside the old Bethnal Green Town Hall. And there are blocks of flats now, but back in the 1890s, Thomas Allenson bought a flour mill here and converted it to make wholemeal flour. And diet reform is particularly concerned with a more wholemeal diet, with more in the way of fresh foods, um, raw foods. It's a reaction against the kind of heavily cooked, processed foods of the 19th century. And on contraception. He was an advocate of the then new birth control movement and preached its methods among the working classes. Mr. Hills regarded these methods as cutting at the root of morals. Mohandas records how, despite his protestations, Dr. Allenson was thrown out of the society basically for not being Victorian enough. I'm in the quiet of Fitzroy Square, 
18th, 19th century buildings. There are embassies with flags outside. And there's a beautiful rectangular dark plaque on the wall of the building saying, George Bernard Shaw lived in this house. From the coffers of his genius, he enriched the world. Vegetarianism even boasts two of the biggest writers of the age, the young socialist satirist Shaw and the venerable Russian Tolstoy, who we'll meet next episode. And as well as esoteric theosophy, vegetarianism also spreads into several Christian groups, such as the Quakers. Dr Samantha Calvert is an expert in Christian vegetarianism. We're in the restaurant at Friends House, the British headquarters of the Quakers. Now, the restaurant isn't itself vegetarian, but they are one of the more vegetarian-friendly Christian denominations. Um, well, there's a long tradition of concern for animals in, within the, the Quaker tradition. There are a number of texts within Christianity which are very much pro-meat consumption, as well as some which very clearly aren't. But I think that the Quakers are very much freed of that. They're very much guided by a personal um, experience and by a personal testimony and by what they call the light within. They set up an anti-vivisection group in 99 and a veggie group in 1909 and they'll play a bigger role in the 20th century. A couple of other new Christian sects promote vegetarianism for reasons besides animals. The Seventh-day Adventists in America, who will feature next show, and the Salvation Army, who begin with social work in the Victorian slums. It was very much held up as the the ideal, uh, partly for the health of the officers of the, the Salvation Army. It was also a very frugal diet. It was felt to be a much cheaper diet. And there was a very strong link in the 19th century to alcoholism, so it was felt that a vegetarian diet was, in some respects, a cure for alcoholism. Though this tenet won't long outlive the Salvation Army's first generation. So I think it's almost a lost history of Salvationism, that there was this strong link to vegetarianism, it was promoted to its officers, and now somehow it's been lost completely. By the turn of the 20th century, socialism is becoming less radical, more practical, and a little less associated with vegetarianism. But the loudest voice against eating animals is a cross-denominational Christian group the Order of the Golden Age. The name harks back to Christian vegetarianism's recurring theme, the Garden of Eden. The Order of the Golden Age, for example, was almost like another vegetarian society at various points in history. They had a large fundraising concert at the Royal Albert Hall, for example, that had an attendance of 6,000 people. They had 300 poster sites on the London Underground advertising a vegetarian diet and the work of their organisation. These are things that even today any animal welfare or animal rights group would still be proud of. I feel as if we've forgotten just how big the Victorian vegetarian movement is and how it's set the image for the later movement from lentils to sandals. And this is becoming a global movement. New vegetarian groups are spreading around the world. Australian Vegetarian the Punjab Vegetarian Society, the Catalonia, the Bombay Humanitarian. The world's vegetarians gather in 1893 as part of the Columbia World Exposition. Uh, the Columbian Exposition is a celebration of um, America's movement towards sort of uh, a world power on the global stage. It's the first electrified World's Fair, so it's just this incredible spectacle of technology. There's a three-day World Congress of Vegetarians where they take their place alongside other reform movements. It's a moment in which vegetarianism as an ideal is recognized as a true global movement for the first time, on par with the other sort of large-scale reform movements that are being promoted at the World's Fair. Some of these are strictly religious, but others include the women's rights movement gets a fair hearing at the World's Fair. It brings together not just Henry S. Club and Arnold Hills, but vegetarians from across the world. You have Indian vegetarians, a, a group of um, Punjabi Indians speak at this event. You have people from Switzerland, literally from all over the globe. But the United States and Great Britain are the two places that are most represented in terms of numbers of speakers at the event. Next episode, we'll take a look at some of these movements such as the vegan anarchists of France or the German Lebensreformers. My tour of Victorian vegetarian London 
has shown me how it's at the international crossroads of vegetarianism. On my way home, I come across a familiar face. And in a park in a nice London square, opposite what was once the, uh, the headquarters of the Theosophists, there's a statue of Mahandas. But old, naked, apart from a piece of cloth, cross-legged. And on the stone under it, it doesn't give his first name, it just gives his surname. Gandhi and the title India has given him Mahatma great soul so next episode we'll meet Mahandas Gandhi again in India with the music of Rob Masters and the US Army Band and the voices of Chet and Patek, Amy Saul, Ian Russell Matthew Aronson, Orna Clement and as Mahandas Karamanchan Gandhi Harish Bimani this episode is generously sponsored by Kickstarter backer Ashik Shah. Thank you, Ashik. And please follow on Facebook and Twitter.com slash veganoption and discover more at theveganoption.org. Please, if you like the show, help get the word out, particularly with reviews on iTunes or your podcast provider. It really does help. And thank you very much for listening.